Good evening and welcome to the Midland Board of Education regularly scheduled meeting on November 12th, 2012. Madam Secretary, would you call roll, please? <clears throat> President Malt? Here. Vice President Wasserman? Here. Secretary Baker is here. Treasurer Oley? Here. Me Member Branstad? Here. Member Gordon? Here. And Member Kaminsky? Here. Can you see me now? There was a light, there was a light show. <laughs> Say thank they you. said your what, name, the lights name? came on. <laughs> oh, thank you, and uh, thanks, for everybody, for being here. So um, um, the consent agenda is uh, not very long this evening, but is there anything that anybody would like removed or have a comment on before we go through that? If not, we'll start with the uh, 2.1, the approval of the regular minute, meeting minutes from Monday, October 12th, or I'm sorry, October 22nd, 2012. 2.2 is the following staff members have announced their resignations. 2.3 is the Mid-American Third Party Administrator for the District's 403B plan. 2.4 is the August 28, 2000 meeting the board approved the Connect Care Medi Medical and Prescription Benefit effective uh, no November 2000. Uh, 2.5 is the following textbooks uh, are, are being presented for a 28-day uh, period of examination. 2.6 is the approval of the following legal bills. I move approval of consent items 2.1 through 2.6. Support. Move my, moved by Mr. Oli, supported by Mr. Wasserman. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All the same sign. Consent agenda is approved. Request to address the board. And we have a couple of folks in the audience that have uh, indicated they would like to come to the, uh, up to the podium. Um, so whoever would like to be first. And uh, please state your name, your address, and your affiliation with Midland Public. And uh, we'd like to limit, uh, so for sake of the agenda this evening, uh, your comments to five minutes, please. Okay, my name is Becky Hoon. I live at 4500 Washington Street. And I'm here um, for the Great Lakes Bay Early College Program. Okay, uh, my name is Michelle Smith. Okay. Um, what we're here for is we want to know um, why the decision was made that the seniors do not get to participate with their graduating class. Because I have a senior this year, and um, we were told that the kids could walk with their class, but their diploma they would receive the following year, so it would be 2014. And so her daughter, I mean, she was told right in the same room with this, the program director, that her child will be able to walk also. And I've talked to several other parents. So everybody's under the assumption in this class, or in this um, Great Lakes Bay Early College, that you get to walk with your class, but you get your diploma the following year. So we want to know why you guys made the decision for the seniors not to walk with the graduating class. OK. Um, and, and you can't answer that question now, right? Well. We we'll, we would prefer not to answer that question now, but we would you know what I would suggest to you, and and and, and I'm glad you you brought this to our attention. Uh, certainly an issue that, um, as a parent, I understand your concern. We as a board would uh, would direct you to the superintendent and his staff to help um, get through this process and determine what uh, the policy is and how how we can better address it. So I'll, I'll leave you with that. Um, did you contact any other administrators prior to this? Well, I, I talked, well, I have facts here, but um, I talked to Mr. Ellinger about this um, for about a half hour on the phone. We discussed it, and I told him that I was going to come to the board meeting, and um, I mean, I'm really upset with it because and my daughter's a senior, and um, there's a lot of issues that she's going, I mean, she's working her butt off at school, at college, or, you know, she's taking college courses and stuff at Saginaw Valley, and she's looking actually to get a scholarship to play softball at colleges. So she's got all this stuff on her plate, and then to be told that she can't walk with a graduating class. This is, mm -hmm. this is huge. I mean, why would you want to go after you get your degree at Saginaw Valley, you want to come back? and walk with the 2014 class. Nobody's going to want to do that. So it's really it's setting this, this program up for a failure for our Midland and Dow High students because there's 22, and this is one of the facts, is there's 20, over 20 schools involved in this, and our two schools are the only ones that are not letting the seniors walk. Okay. All right. So one, one thing I'd like to say is my husband did speak with uh, Mr. Ellinger, and he 
he said it was not his decision, that it was a school board decision, not his. So he actually, we're here because you it's said to be here. Right. So now you're saying to address him, which we've already done. So I guess I was under the impression that this was something that you all decided on. Okay. Ken, let me, let me just clarify a little bit because we're dealing with partial information here, and it's part of what I'd like to talk to the Administrative Services Study Committee about after the meeting. Um, the, the, these two ladies are absolutely right. There's some miscommunication. However, it hasn't been miscommunicated when the orientation meetings have been held on our site. Mrs. Hoon and I talked, and for her orientation, she went to a meeting, I think it was at Heritage. Is that what she told me? Right, but I... <clears throat> Hang on. Just let me finish, if you would. Yep. And, and so the information that the early college folks share is customized based on how those districts share their information. Mrs. Hoon and I had a fairly lengthy conversation, more like 50 minutes on the mm -hmm. phone, and we worked through this issue. Um, I think it's worthy of the policy study committee of the board to understand the merits and understand both sides of the position. And that's what I told them. I said, certainly you're welcome to come. I never said that I didn't have a role in it. I recommended to the board because we have board policy that says unless you graduate, you do not participate in graduation. And we've had other requests for exceptions that the board has not granted. We've dealt with some of those in the last couple of years. I think we have room to find some middle ground here, but we need an opportunity to work through that with the policy right. study committee of the board. When and you say the student hasn't graduated, what does that mean? Well, w what it means, and this is a little difference of opinion between the early college program, because I've talked to their coordinator down there, and I've requested that they stop telling parents that they have finished their high school credits, which they've told some of your parents, I think uh, Mrs. Hoon was told this, that after this semester, kids have earned their high school credits. Well, that's not exactly the conditions under which the Michigan Department of Ed authorizes an early college program. They should go through the whole program, and then they earn their high school diploma. That's what the Michigan Department of Ed says they need to do. And so this program we knew was going to go through some growing pains, which it has. We've communicated our very unique special needs. We've had our curriculum people compare our math curriculum, for example, against the math curriculum at the early college program. They don't offer a parallel math experience that we do. So our board is a... about that? I feel that that is irrelevant because you can have a student... Do you not allow a student who's in special education to graduate with their graduating class? Because my daughter's in a, in a higher math level. So if, you, if she went through Dow and she was in a, how, uh, like a .2 class or whatever it is at Dow or whatever number the higher math level is, and then someone is in special ed, or even let's say they're not. Let's just say that they are a student who isn't applying themselves and they do very poorly in school. They still most likely are going to graduate because the fact is we don't not graduate a lot of students, and so they're going to walk the same graduation with my daughter. And so I don't understand that concept of the math level because kids are at all different levels, yeah. and really we should consider that because we don't want to push a kid. Like each kid learns differently and at different levels, and they still are entitled to a diploma. Right. I would suggest that we not um, try to do point counterpoint here because that's not the forum to do that. I've been, I think I've worked very hard. I think Mrs. Hoon indicated to me in the phone call, she appreciated it, how much I listened to her. And we have an arrangement when her daughter finishes the first semester, we're going to take a look at her transcript. So I think we have some common ground we might be able to find here. But the next appropriate step, if that's what you direct me to do as a board, okay. is to have a subcommittee review that. And that's what I was alluding to, okay? I'm not saying that it's, I push it back on Mr. Ellinger. It certainly is a board, board policy that we've adopted it's, it, at some point in the past. And I think it was actually uh, just a short while ago we changed that policy. But this is the first that we've learned of this issue. And I'm not uh, belittling the issue, that fact. It's not, a, it's not a big deal for us to, to certainly look into this. And, uh, we'll pull the administrative uh, subcommittee, which deals with this issue and rec makes recommendation to the full board, of which I chair, uh, in a very timely manner to make sure that we address this issue and see if we can't come to that middle ground. So, um, well, can, can I make? I just want a couple facts that um, I went to our principal, Mrs. Greif. She knew nothing about this two weeks ago. 
that's a problem. I went to um, the athletic director, just spoke with him last week on Thursday, Friday. He knew nothing about this. I talked to a counselor, and I just talked to her Saturday at the football game, and she said that she knew nothing about that. She's telling her students that they can walk with their graduating class. No, no, uh, just know nothing about what? I mean, I, I they don't, they the knew policy? nothing about the seniors not be able the to walk. The, uh, yeah, the policy of the student, the seniors, for like my instance, my daughter not being able to walk with the senior class. So she's telling these students at counseling, when they're coming in the counseling thing about this program yep. and letting them know that you'll get your diploma the following year, but you get to walk with your senior class because that's what everybody thinks. Okay. So I just want parents to know because I don't want them to go through what I'm going through right now. It's supposed to be a good time. My daughter just got senior pictures. They're going to be in the yearbook. What for if she's not going to be able to graduate this year? Graduation yeah. party. I mean, it is a big thing. It's supposed to be fun, and it's, it's, it's turmoil in our house, and right. I want it to end. I want some conclusion. And so do we. And so, we, again, you can be rest assured that the Administrative Service Committee um, we'll meet before I leave town to, uh, or at least uh, have set up the meeting before I leave town to address this issue, and we'll get back with you. Okay, so we'll get like a written notice to us. Uh, actually, we'll have we'll do better than that. We'll probably have a direct communication with you uh, verbally or, or, or in some manner. Okay, I'd that. really appreciate that. Okay. Thank you so much for I, your time. I think it would be good to have a written reasoning if you guys do come to the conclusion that you're going to stand by what you're saying and they're not going to walk. I would like to have that in writing the reasons why. Oh. I mean, I have one and looked That's at this. <laughs> yeah. But is that okay or not? We'll, we'll let you know what the outcome of the, the committee's recommendation were and, it, and if any changes. And if there is a uh, change or, uh, or if we uh, continue with the policy, then uh, you'll have, a, you'll have an, a clear understanding as to why we do what we do. Okay. okay. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else that would like to address the board at this time? If not, we will move on to Board of Education Matters, Northeast and Jefferson Schools Limited Resident School of Choice, Mr. Valendi. As you are well aware, with the closing of uh, Central at the end of this year, um, all our students will be attending either Jefferson or, or Northeast. Now we've spent a lot of time over the last few months taking a look at how those numbers might sort out between the two schools. Just uh, based on the geography, et cetera, to ask a few pertinent questions that uh, we may need to come with recommendations on. One of those being, will the current boundaries that we have for Dow High and Midland High uh, work geographically with the numbers and with the room space available at the two schools? And secondly, um, if those boundaries are fine, uh, what uh, would be the effect on a schools of choice program for those coming into Jefferson and Northeast, and of course from the feeder elementary schools. We feel pretty confident based on patterns we've seen uh, over the last few years in projecting those forward and advancing kids that are currently in Jefferson and Northeast that uh, we can accommodate um, the students at those two particular buildings after looking at absolutely every room in both of those buildings uh, that we can make that work. However, it would be good uh, to see that our projections of schools of choice patterns, et cetera, um, will work out by taking our schools of choice program uh, and for current fifth, sixth, and seventh grade students, which will be our middle school students next year, having an early window for the schools of choice. So we are going to be uh, publishing a, the limited schools of choice, an early window just for current fifth, sixth, and seventh um, uh, gr grade students, which will be the middle school class of next year, so that by the end of this calendar year, we'll have a very, very clear understanding of how those schools of choice patterns are going, what will be the total population at Jefferson and Northeast, how does that match up with the room utilization that we've been studying for the past three months, and it gives us plenty of time to plan uh, the rest of the year going forward, the transition, et cetera. So this is uh, only different in two ways. Number one, it'll be earlier for this population. All the rest of the schools of choice will be on our normal timeline, and those schools of choice for the elementaries and for the high schools will take place and uh, will open February 8th. However, uh, we are going to do this 
uh, one in the fall here for the middle school students with uh, uh, applications needing to be submitted uh, by December 21st. It is also a limited schools of choice program, limited only in the sense that if by um, some change of the patterns, et cetera, we have way too many at one school, we may need to limit the number that we will allow of resident schools of choice, this is resident only at this point, uh, resident schools of choice, and as is the appropriate uh, process uh, stipulated in law, we would then have a lottery. Quite honestly, based on the patterns that we've seen, we think that we can honor all, uh, most if not all, resident schools of choice here um, in, uh, for this coming year with the room utilization that we have planned. But we want to make sure uh, that we do this and we do this early. We are not bringing to you a recommendation for any changes in the boundary lines because we believe with those boundary lines we've tracked where all the population of our students is throughout the entire district and we still think that it will work with our resident schools of choice in giving them first opportunities to have that happen. So who should apply for this not, uh, resident schools of choice program in this early window? Number one, it's only fifth, sixth, and seventh grade students who do not plan on attending the school in their district. In other words, those that are slated on a path towards Midland High School would attend Northeast. Those on a path to Dow High would attend Jefferson. Now, those who are already schools of choice to a different uh, school in that region, they need not apply because they're already schools of choice into either an elementary or that middle school, and that carries through as long as they follow the geographic pattern. For example, if somebody was in the Northeast area, uh, had school of choice uh, uh, to Adams as a fifth grader, that person, that student, would continue the Adams, Jefferson, Dow High path. We're just moving forward all the current students, either schools of choice or residents, from their current levels. Those who would need to apply are those who are not in that pattern, want to break that pattern, and let's say were slated to go to Dow High, wanted to go to Northeast, they would have to put in a schools of choice request for that. And in this early period, we would see that uh, those choices uh, can be approved and there will be an approve, uh, approval uh, letter coming to those households uh, in January. So kids will have that certainty of knowing where they will be going next year. That's another reason for the uh, early window on this. Question. Gary, Gary, is it fair to say that this is really what parents have indicated to us they want to have happen? Especially because the earlier for them that they can know, the more they can make plans. For exactly. Them. Yeah. And for us, it is good too because we need to make sure that we have an even balance so we can make that room utilization work. We think right now, if the pattern holds what's happened before in the Adams area, for example, or uh, from those who have schools of choice from Central in the past. We think that it will work um, for those schools of choice uh, applications to be honored, but we want to be safe. Sure. Yeah, uh, several. Uh, number one, I'm presuming there'll be a really good communication to every student's parent that's in this in these schools, so they know, gee, I shouldn't put back in because this is where I want to go. It'll, it'll lay out the maps to where they're supposed to go, and if they want to change, exactly. what they got to do. And also, I think it's December fifth. Uh, Jeff, is it December 5th? The, uh, we have an orientation plan. I really feel strongly that people need to have enough information before yeah. they make those choices. On uh, the 5th, we have arranged that there will be an open house at Jefferson and Northeast um, staggered <coughs> so that any parents can go visit the staff over at uh, Jefferson, there first, Jeff? Okay, at Northeast first and get to meet the staff, tour the building, get questions answered, and then they can, uh, there's a uh, time period between the other house, then they can uh, go over to yes. Jefferson and do exactly the same thing so they have the information. We put those open houses are planned earlier for the convenience of those parents as well. And you've taken a look and you're anticipating how people will select. How far off could your anticipation be before it swings at where we're gonna be in lottery? It, it all depends on 
A lot of this has to do with transportation as well. Um, I, I believe that we have a pretty good, darn good chance uh, that we're going to come within that, um, within that number. And we do even have, as we've looked at both buildings, some wiggle room. Uh, the, the wild part sometimes is it's not the total numbers that end up at one school or the other. Sometimes it's how it divides by grade level. And sometimes if you look at how they're going to divide out into sections, that can make a difference. So we want to take a look at all of those things. But based on the pattern that we've seen uh, in the past, and when you project forward, even though it's four grades, the Dow High and Midland High, that's pretty much how it's split. And we think that is very workable. And my last one is, I presume that the out of district school of choice can only go to a place where there's an opening. And that will be later. We after do, after we, we know this. We deal yep. with residents first. And, um, that's the, the point of this, is giving um, uh, the parents um, a chance, the resident parents a chance to pick where they want their kids to go. Other questions? John. I just say thanks for being proactive on this. I can see that just trying to get the residents to know where they're going, going early, um, you know, and having this all wrapped up is with the non-resident school of choices and anything that can come up well before we conclude with the school year, it's very appreciative and also any surprises on building utilization and so forth. So and like you said, with those individual grades, there may be a lot of third graders, or not third graders, but seventh graders, you know, in one particular building. And so it's, it's just good to have uh, parents communicated to as uh, much right. as possible. Uh, just a, a shout out to our three middle school principals who have spent a lot of time in conference room nine with me as we try to project these numbers. Jim Vallier has been we're scoping out the transportation. Great. Linda's been involved. And then we're going to be bringing teachers into this to help with the transition and answering some of the other questions. But the key question that needs to be asked first is, do the boundaries have to change? And can we honor resident schools of choice, which we've tried to do in so many ways in the past? Gary's done a really nice job with this transition committee. I mean, along with all the people they just mentioned, they've met multiple times. It takes a lot of planning. Mm -hmm. You know what, months ahead of time, as we learned from the elementary um, consolidation, to make this happen. We had, I think, just what, last Monday, Jeff, um, staff from Central visit, I can't remember if it was Northeast. They went to Jefferson so they could get a feel for the Jefferson staff, and the Jefferson staff could understand from the Central staff what kind of learner profile, profile is coming with the Central students. So there's a lot of transition work that's been done, and they plan to do the same thing with Northeast. Linda, I have one question with respect to the out of uh, district of choice do we have a number of, uh, approximately uh, just a ballpark on what that how that impacts our middle schools what I can say is the majority uh, of that happens at the elementary level the non-resident we do tend to pick up extra students at the middle school in sixth grade uh, sometimes that's uh, uh, parents making the choices from uh, out of district. Sometimes that's in district uh, coming from the parochial schools coming into middle school starting with sixth grade. So sixth grade is not quite as up and down as the kindergarten would be at the elementary, right. but there is some movement from year to year in that sixth grade. I would have to check the specific numbers, but I don't think middle school is a big point of entry okay. for non-resident schools of choice. Uh, the one exception might be uh, students who are hoping to get in place in eighth grade so that it uh, uh, keeps their athletic eligibility for high school. Okay. Uh, but it's not huge numbers. Uh, Mr. Verlindi is correct. Most of our non-resident students come in at some point in elementary school. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Any other questions? That was for information only, uh, for the board's information. So um, thank you again, Gary. And, uh, Job well done with the three administrators of those buildings. So, with that, I'll move to Mr. Ellinger on a NEOLA policy. Yeah, you have a NEOLA policy number 0150 that talks about the uh, overall organization of the Board of Education uh, in front of you and um, that was sent to you prior to this meeting. There's no massive change in what we would normally do at the Board's organizational meeting that traditionally we used to hold in July. But since we have been forced um, by the legislation, to move to November elections for board members. That causes our organizational meeting to move to January. So when you look at um, policy 0151, 
it just changes the date to January when the old policy referred to that as July. You look at the election of officers, which will begin that process tonight at the end of the meeting. Same process that we followed. Uh, when you get down to uh, motions uh, that we would make at the organizational meeting from what attorneys you want to use to what bank depositories you would designate and so on, all that is what we have always done. But we just needed to update the policy and everything from 0155 um, is the exact duplicate of what was in your old policy. So this is before you for a first reading tonight. We'll ask for action on it at our next meeting just so we get that done prior to January 1st. Questions? Pretty clear cut. All right. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Um, next is a recommended for action a summer tax request. Uh, Mrs. Klein. Yes. Uh, we are looking ahead to the summer of 2013. And this is something that we're required to do by law before January 1st, and that is to notify the city that we would like them to collect summer taxes on our behalf. And this goes back to a 1982 summer tax collection statute, which was then upheld by the Michigan Court of Appeals in 1985. And it allows us to collect uh, up to half of our taxes during the summertime. And we do that by collecting just within the city, and we leave the township collection and the remaining half of the city for the winter tax collection. So in order to do that, we have to notify the city by January 1. I always like to get that done sometime in November, just in case we have inclement weather at one of our board meetings. I don't like it to go until the last one. So Ms. Baker will read the resolution that requests the city to collect on our behalf. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Whereas Act 333, Public Acts of Michigan 1982, provides that a school district may determine by resolution to impose a summer property tax levy of one half or all its annual school property taxes, including debt service, and whereas this Board of Education adopted such a resolution on November 24, 1986, providing for a summer property tax levy of one half of school property taxes, including debt service upon property located within the city of Midland, and providing such levy in 1987 and continuing from year to year thereafter. And whereas for each year such resolution applies, the school district must request before January 1st that the city of Midland agree to collect the summer taxes summer tax levy in the following year of either the total or one half of school property taxes, including debt service on property within the city of Midland. And whereas set at, said Act 333 provides for certain procedural steps to be taken by this Board of Education in connection with imposition of a summer property tax levy and also provides for the manner in which summer, such summer property tax levy shall be collected. Now, therefore, be it resolved that, one, this Board of Education, pursuant to 1982 Public Act 333, hereby imposes a summer property tax levy of one half of school property taxes, including debt service upon property located within the school district within the City of Midland for the year 2013 and continuing from year to year as authorized by statute. And second, the Secretary of this Board of Education is authorized and directed to forward a copy of this resolution to the governing body of the City of Midland, together with this Board of Education's request that they agree to collect the summer tax levy for the ensuing year in the amount as specified in this resolution. A copy of this resolution and the request to collect the summer tax levy shall be sent so that they are received by the City of Midland before January 1, 2013. Thank you. So move to a movement to uh, su uh, support and vote on the resolution. Support. Moved by Mr. Washington, supported by Mr. Ole, and I believe it's a roll call vote. Yep. Yeah. So, Madam Secretary. All right. President Mall. Yes. And Vice President Wasserman. Yes. Secretary Baker. Yes. Treasurer Ole. Yes. Member Bradstad? Yes. And Member Gorton? Yes. And Member Kaminsky? Yes. Thank you. And you have your resolution. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn. Thank you. Next on the agenda is uh, Northeast Viking Leadership 
trip to Washington, D.C., and that's Mr. Valindi and I believe Mr. Jaster. Yes, we have Mr. Jaster here, uh, principal at Northeast, and Kim Shell uh, Drake Formsma, who is the advisor of the um, Northeast Viking leadership uh, team. And just as a precursor here, um, as you are well aware, how Minnesota Public Schools works po board policy uh, stipulates that um, students are not to be going on uh, field trips or trips uh, over 90 miles without getting approval from the Board of Education. Mr. Jaster and uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Sheldrake Formsma have submitted a letter to uh, um, Mr. Ellinger here asking for an exception, and I think for some very good reason. Therefore, we are uh, recommending an approval of an exception to this trip uh, so that the Northeast Viking Leadership Council, which is an equivalent of a student council uh, at North Northeast, can take a trip to Washington, D.C. Um, on February 14th through 18th. I'd like to point out that the 14th is a uh, teacher in-service day, so students are not uh, in session that day, and then the 18th, the Monday, is a vacation day. So they will be traveling uh, by bus over the period of time, and will uh, of the 14th through the 18th, will not need to miss any school. So that's not um, a consideration. And this can be a very uh, valuable trip for the students, but it is beyond the 90 miles. Um, I would like to point out that the uh, um, council over at Northeast uh, has the money set aside in their club accounts to pay for this trip of 40 to 50 students uh, from Northeast who have been part of this um, le leadership uh, council over the past few years. And so we recommend approval of this. And if you have any questions, I can throw those over to Jeff and Kim. Move we'll approval. Support. <coughs> Move we'll by Mr. Oli, supported by Mr. Washerman. Discussion or questions of those who would offer themselves up for such an endeavor. Does, does he get to go too? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's Valentine's night, remember. <laughs> I would like to make a comment, though. Um, uh, earlier, I think it was before I was even on the board, my son was involved in debate at Dow High. And the 90-mile limit thing always came up to go to these high-level debate tournaments that they could never go to because it's more than 90 miles. And I came to recognize and talk to enough old board members of why the policy existed. And the policy existed so that everybody doesn't go nuts and, and start traveling big distances when there are things locally available, uh, like sports teams going to Columbus, Ohio, for instance, or something like that. So in this case, I sit there and go, well, this is an easy decision for me because this is a – it's not like they're going out of out of a range where they could get something equivalent. It's uh, it's self financing. Great for the kids to be self financed. It's a great lesson. So uh, it's very easy for me to do. John, and here in the uh, description there was uh, something about it was contracted with a separate organization. So we're not using our vehicles for transportation. We're liability wise, it's you pay a fee and they're providing the service. So. It's just one question I was going to ask is, you know, is there any of our uh, liabilities or anything with that? But it seems like that's covered and well thought out. I guess the question would, would be, should be asked is, would you ride up a school bus to Washington, D.C.? <laughs> <laughs> I want to know if our school bus has ever gone that far anyway. <laughs> well, well, last, last Not year some of the ones who just retired. <laughs> last year with it being 100 years of Girl Scouts, I can tell a few families that I know that rode in minivans with a bunch of girls to Washington, D.C. Okay. In, in the 90 degree heat. So do we have any construct? Do we have any constructive <laughs> questions of Mr. Jasper? I just yeah. Yes, Lynn. I just comment that I d I just think the Viking Leadership Program has just been tremendous. It, it involves a lot more students. That it just the whole um, idea of it versus the old student council way. There's nothing wrong with student council, but I think at that age, um, Kim and Jeff and your predecessors have done a really <coughs> nice job of. of allowing lots of kids to be involved and learn those leadership skills. So what, what a special opportunity to be able to go to Washington, D.C. And, and see a government in action, especially at this time of year. Or in action. <laughs> well, we're actually breaking ground, I think. I'm not sure that a uh, middle school group has ever yeah, been allowed to travel trip. out of state in this manner. Right. And we had quite a discussion at the agenda group before we decided to bring this recommendation to you about the merits of that. and. You know, the world is a different place than what it was uh, 20 years ago or 30 years ago when this policy was put in place. You would like to think that maybe even middle school kids are more engaged in the kind of issues 
uh, nowadays that uh, they're hearing about in places like Washington, D.C. So we view it as an educational trip, and I yeah. think uh, Jeff and Kim do um, as well. And actually, it was quite easy for us to get behind bringing the recommendation, but it needed to be a board decision. Okay. Okay, without any further humor, um, we have a motion and support on the table. All those in favor of this mo of this uh, request, <coughs> signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Enjoy your trip. Okay, moving on to um, another fun thing on our agenda this evening, and that's a community-wide music fund agreement. Mrs. Klein. Yes. Uh, at the end of this presentation, we will ask for you to authorize Mr. Ellinger to sign a fund agreement with the Midland Area Community Foundation to establish an ongoing fund to support uniform purchases. And this came out of the superintendent subcommittees that met two years ago. Um, those of you who were on the board at that time may remember that we had four subcommittees that were charged with finding some alternative funding sources for athletics, extracurricular programs, international baccalaureate, and the elementary and co-curricular elements of the music program. And one of the very direct recommendations of the music committee was to hold a community-wide fundraiser, similar to the one that was done for tuning up that supported musical instrument purchases, and use it to support uniform purchases at, high, at the two high schools. And the rationale for this was that it was probably uh, much better for the community to do this together rather than for the individual booster groups to try to hold separate fundraisers and that collectively they would be able to do much better. Uh, and it would probably be better supported by the community. So that has actually come to fruition. And we have with us this evening Nancy Peeler, from the Midland High School Music Boosters, and Dominic Zoller from the Dow High School Music Boosters. And they are going to share with you the collective idea that they are presenting for a fundraiser for the uniforms. And tonight they will unveil the name. It will not be tuning up. Uh, it will have its own name and its own honorary co-chair. But if it has anywhere close to the success of tuning up, I think we'll be very happy with the results. Their goal is going to be to raise $250,000 for uniforms. And both of the music groups have already committed $2,500 from their individual groups. So collectively, the fund is already starting with $5,000. And with that, I'll let them begin. Hi, I'm Nancy Peeler from the Midland High School Music Parents Association. I have a daughter, Zoe, who is a senior at Midland High. Dominic Sauer, president of the Music Boosters for Dow High. I also have a senior, a daughter, Shelby. <laughs> and we want to challenge you to think back to the early to mid-1990s, and where were you? I was here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so now here's the question. Where is your wardrobe <laughs> from that time frame? Because what we want you to know is that for both high schools, for the music programs, they're still wearing the same uniforms, the same concert dresses, the same tuxedos that they were wearing in the 1990s. Um, most, some of them were purchased as long as 20 years ago now. And most of these uniforms have been designed to be used for 10 years. So we are um, way beyond that. And that is thanks to the efforts of both programs and the music parents in both programs for really making an effort to maintain those uniforms so well. Um, there's been dry cleaning, zippers replaced, buttons replaced. We've even taken to completely um, rebuilding the seats of some of the pants because that's what we needed to do to get through. Oh, wow. And um, I, we brought a couple of examples for you. Oh, <laughs> you we believe you. We believe you. <laughs> uh, the fabric, yeah, and, and you can see with this is just one example from one uniform. Um, the fabric is disintegrating. It's not a major matter of the threads are falling apart. The fabric is literally disintegrating because they have had so much use. And we're kind of at a tipping point where we really need to graduate these uniforms and move them on. <laughs> and we need to invest um, in f bringing about some new uniforms for both of the school programs, for marching band, for tuxedos, for the orchestra, for the choral programs, concert dresses for the choral programs as well. What else can I say? What a marvelous opportunity to partner with the Midland Area Community Foundation, much the same as we did with Tuning Up. Um, we're blessed in a stunning community that understands the value and appreciates the educational moment that happens in music. And we need to take advantage of that. Uh, and if I left you with one last thought, it would be I want to make sure that this organization, both at Midland and at Dow, 
looks as good as they sound. Um, and it is a package deal. And we'd love for your support. Last question I have is what can we do to help you make an informed decision? What's the name? Ooh. <laughs> I don't want to mess it up. I would screw this up. Looking sharp. Oh, oh, very good. Right? Which is Versus looking great flat. Double right? entendre. <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. Um, and Mr. Jim Holmeyer has agreed to be the face ah. of Looking Sharp. Uh, great uh, member of the community that uh, has a lot of connections uh, throughout the region. Uh, and he really is the face of music in the Midland area. So it's, it's a great fit for us. It's nice. Very good. So. Very neat. Very neat. Questions? That's a great idea. Yeah. I, I, would, I would just say I was on the superintendent study committees, and it's good to see some ideas that came out of that and uh, be able to take the community, be able to take off with that, and um, be able to benefit the students. And it's just great to see the collective work of our community. And I've never too turned a, a student away at my, my doorstep, whether it's basketball, Girl Scout cookies, or whatever else, uh, music cards and things like that. So I think it's just a good example of, of having our community maybe put a, hopefully not a 20 year investment, but at least a 10 year investment <laughs> into the uniform. So it's great to see good effort with you guys. Thank you. Interested in your timeline and some of the, the plan strategies, tactics, any given yeah. that thought? Quite a variety. Um, we, for tuning up, we had the whole note, quarter note, half note moment, which was mm -hmm. kind of a neat way to get people thinking about size. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some other opportunities here where we might be able to think of it like a gift registry. Oh, I'd like to sponsor a few cummerbunds or maybe a shako, or a jacket, or a cape. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's an opportunity as well. Uh, the thing that I like about the way that the system is structured in the paperwork is that there's an incredible amount of flexibility. Uh, in terms of timeline, uh, there's two contexts to that. One is we have an urgent need to replace uniforms. Uh, so we're going to be working diligently to do a pretty, pretty hefty fundraiser to the tune of $250,000 to meet that need. Once you buy a uniform, the maintenance begins. So the idea of having a five-year renewal is also a part of the, the strategy. If we need to take advantage of that, we can. If not, then we can go ahead and retire that aspect. I'm trying to do some simple math in my head per, per uniform, uniform cost. If you buy them singly, it's about 1000 bucks a piece. Oh. Okay, so this isn't something you go pick up at Walmart. Okay, yeah. the beauty of it is if you get up past the 75 unit mark, yeah. uh, the price drops to about 700 $600 a yeah, piece. I was thinking 600 on my head. It's like, what, 500 How many kids yeah. do we have? Uh, 207 oh. and 187 okay, this so week. 400. That could okay. change because it's growing. Yeah. And then you have um, you have the orchestra programs and the vocal music yes. programs yeah. as well. <laughs> so you just take those numbers and multiply them. Okay. Tuxedo's a little cheaper, about 150. Dresses, roughly about 70. Sure. Um, I think it was my first year or second year on the board. We were going through the very first things of starting to reduce costs and the music parents came and they were very concerned and I remember Clint Struthers and some others came and I was so impressed because two months later they came back and said we got a deal for you and they started tuning up and they were the, one of the first groups that got out of the box and said we're not here to ask you for money we're asking you for permission to go do this and I was so impressed with that so I've been a regular contributor to tuning up just my kids were music <laughs> kids too but just because of that initiative um, I'm hoping everybody in the community sees your initiative here tonight to take control of the situation and not be subject to the whims of what's happening in the land <coughs> and just taking control. So my hat's off to you. Uh, I'm going to congratulate you in advance just for setting it up. We congratulate you again when uh, you have all the new uniforms. And when's the first day you can send a check? <laughs> when, uh, do you have a date? Can I send a check tomorrow? Uh, we, not yet. We still have uh, the next step, which is after you agree that this is a good you idea. you got to go and set it all up. <laughs> <laughs> and we get a signature, then we get to also spend some time with the Midland Area Community Foundation. They're very supportive, um, and I'm excited about it because not only are they interested in helping us with this project, they already have leads on donors such as yourself mm -hmm. that are excited to be a part of it. So Great. they can't wait. Well, we I will so wait <coughs> because I have to wait. <laughs> <can't> wait. <laughs> well, wish you luck, and if there's anything I can privately help you with and all that, how I just wanted to say that both of the music groups have some ideas from the uniform companies as well to do some fundraisers. Um, there were some interesting ideas for how to use the old uniforms, in fact. <laughs> so we might get a little more wear out of them. Are you expecting a redesign of the uniforms? I think that the two schools have had some conversation, and they may go in different directions with that. But the way that we're structuring this is that it gives the flexibility for each school to make the decision that seems best for that school and that works for that band director and that orchestra director and that vocal music.
music director. So um, I'm not sure uh, if that those decisions have been fully made, but I think as they move forward, um, we've built in that flexibility. Yes, and I'd compliment both of, both of you at the schools because <laughs> I know even when Sarah was there four or five years ago and, and they talk about these uniforms and how valuable they are and the volunteers that, as Nancy and Dominic have both said, they work very hard to um, keep them together sewing buttons and all those things. But not only that, the kids take a lot of pride in it and all those parts and keeping it together and, as you said, to make them look as good as they sound. And we've all had many opportunities to hear how fantastic our music our music mm -hmm. students are. So I'm glad to support that and hopefully you'll be very successful. Lynn, when you say that, your, your duct tape budget's going to go down now. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe. <laughs> We hope it um, will go down soon. Yeah. In the short term, <laughs> we may still have to invest. Yes. I'd just like to comment on the fact that I like the, the collaboration between the uh, group and the Middle Area Community Foundation. I think it's a perfect venue for that uh, for that piece, and it's certainly met with success with tuning up, which uh, I know uh, from a personal uh, perspective that that's where the fun was held there and still is uh, held there. Uh, the other thing is, uh, John alluded to it just a, a bit, this is the second piece that's come out of the superintendent's uh, subcommittees that we met a, a couple about a year a little over a year ago uh, boost the booster bash for the athletics was a, the first one and very successful piece and now this is another initiative just uh, uh, showed you the kind of leadership and the quality of uh, the folks in our community that are willing to step up when need be to make sure our students have a quality educational experience uh, including the, uh, the music piece which is vitally important to those young people who have an interest so uh, very well done and thank you for being here this evening Move approval of community-wide music fund agreement, which is now known as Looking Sharp. Very good. Vigorous support. Moved and supported. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. You have your motion and you have your agreement. Good Thank luck you. to you. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. So with that, on to curriculum and instructions. New tech presentation by Dr. Ellison and Mr. Shady. Uh, thank you, Mr. Malt. Uh, at the last board meeting, we presented to you the list of major change proposals and had a presentation. And I indicated at that time that this evening we would also have a second presentation on new tech, which is one of the major changes. So in a long series this evening of positive news items, Mr. Shadig, who is, of course, our current science coordinator, oversees the music program, the Science Resource Center, and most recently has been selected as our new tech uh, leader for right now. It's going to help you to understand that and give some opportunity to ask questions if you have any questions regarding the new tech program. Randy? Well, thank you very much. And thank you for uh, the opportunity to talk a little bit about the new tech program tonight. I've been involved with the uh, exploration for a couple, going on a couple years now. And uh, um, it's kind of exciting to to be in this position that we could actually move in this direction to explore this. Um, since being uh, tapped to head up the exploration I really, about a month ago, I really had two main goals. One of them was information and getting information out to staff and students and parents and community. And the other part is working out the details. And uh, as I've found and those that have been working with me and uh, that I've had con conversations with, working out those details is a, is a big job. And uh, there's a group that I really have to recognize, uh, our steering committee that's been looking at this for, for quite some time. Um, and I wouldn't be here without the, a lot of hard work of Mr. Ellinger, Dr. Ellison, and then uh, especially Penny Miller Nelson and Pam Castle and Janet Greif at both of our high schools. And then also Chris Saburn and Jeff Lauer have been involved with our steering committee and trying to work out uh, how we move this forward and, and where we're at and what we need to do next. So again, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions along the way, please feel free. I tend to step away, so you might have to keep me shackled to this thing. I get kind of moving around. It's tough to stay in one spot. Here's our mission, and I want you to just keep, keep this in mind, and, and the highlight of mine, of course, uh, but a dynamic and world-class ed education. So um, the, the music group just a couple minutes ago asked you to look back. Let's look forward. If we want to be truly dynamic and world-class in a world-class education system, we've got to be able to, to change and look to the future. 
before I go any further, I wanted to take, take a look at, we do a lot of things very well. We have a lot of successes in our school system. So I wanted to bring those to your attention. We're not bringing this forward because we're in, we're in desperate need that we have to do this for all of our students. We've got a lot of very successful students. How do we do that? We provide them a large number of opportunities. We've got a dedicated staff, a supportive community as you just saw. Uh, we've got a variety of programs to try to reach, reach all of our students, and that's our, gain, our goal, to reach each and every student. So how can we improve? Do we need to improve? And I think we absolutely do. What are some of the ways that we're going, that we could do that? Engage students differently. Think for a second, do we have every student that's in our high schools engaged as much as they could be? And what if we could engage them differently, fully pull them into so they're involved in their education where we could take those students? Five things students want from their education. Think about these as we go through a little uh, step by step, talking about what a new tech program could provide for our students. Students said, they want interactive technology. They want to be able to use that technology to its fullest potential. We don't, want, we don't want students to walk through the door and unplug, so to speak. That's how they operate. They want teachers that are close to them, that are mentors, that they can turn to. They want to have the ability to innovate and create. They also want to have choice in what they do. They, wanna, they don't want to learn just how I tell them to learn. They want to be able to figure out how they can learn and apply it. And probably most importantly, real world applications. One of the things that we've, uh, we've seen when we travel to different new tech schools, students can answer the why. Why am I learning this? How many times have you heard that? Why do I need to know this formula? Why do I need to know this fact? Students at, at, at the new tech high schools we've been to can identify why they're learning what they're learning. So again, how can we improve? STEM careers are an area of growth and demand. Um, science, math, technology, and engineering, all are fields that we're seeing growth. Uh-oh. Okay. It went. It went too far. Thank you. Got to go back a couple. And also another critical component, and you've heard a lot of talk about this, is 21st century skills. No longer is it good enough just to have key important knowledge, but we've got to be able to think critically, think creatively, and also communicate well. We hear from employers that they say we have a lot of students, we have a lot of applicants that have that knowledge, but we need people that can think and work with others and create, create new knowledge. So when we talk about new tech, it's an option for our students. What would it provide? It began as a single school in Napa, California in the mid-90s. Uh, right now, there's about 120 schools, one in Australia, 18 different states. In 2001, they received a $6 million uh, grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation to help them expand. Um, they're a nonprofit organization and they provide, they provide the structure that helps schools look at education differently, that helps you reimagine what it, is, what it means to go to school. We've got 10 different sites in Michigan right now, and I think you probably all know one just down the road in Meridian in their first year. So what does it mean to be a new tech school? What's that all about? When you talk about a new tech, school and being part of their organization, they don't have a lot of non-negotiables. They don't have a lot of rules, but they have three foundations that their school is based on. Technology engages, teaching that engages, technology that enables and a culture that empowers students in their, in their learning environment. Each one a little bit more specifically. Pro they use a program called project-based learning. Not me telling you what it is to learn, but students, those projects are designed so that students fully and deeply engage in the content. They're the ones 
delving into that deeply enough to become familiar and really understand the content. It's a lot of hard work to develop a good quality project that makes sure you cover all the state standards that you need to. So it's project-based learning. Business and community partners um, are a key component in that project development and assessment. And a key, another key component is that they, they promote those 21st century skills. Communication, oral communication, written communication, collaboration, and creativity. We talk about the technology that enables. Technology, a part of a new tech network, requires that there's a one-to-one -one computing. Now, they don't dictate what kind of device, but each student has some device that they're utilizing so that they can collaborate throughout the, the, the work on their projects. And it's a culture that empowers. New tech schools are average around 100 students per grade level. So a 400 person high school. Students and teachers have a tremendous amount of choice and they help direct that program. One of the things that we also saw consistently was that students and their teachers were truly committed to the development of their, of their program and of their school. Because they have a choice, they, do be able, they are able to set the direction of where their school is going and it creates a, a real atmosphere of collaboration wherever we've gone. I've got a short video that just talks a little bit about those aspects a little bit differently than, than I did. It's about two minutes long. New Tech Network is a national nonprofit organization that works with schools, districts, and communities to create innovative schools that transform learning. From rural communities to urban cities, you'll find over 115 diverse New Tech schools. Each school has compelling needs, but they all have one thing in common. At the center of all this school transformation are the teachers and principals who get more than 600 hours of planning, training, and professional development to completely reimagine teaching and learning. New Tech follows three design principles that effectively transform a school. Teaching that engages. At a New Tech school, project-based learning replaces memorization and lectures so students learn group collaboration, problem solving, communication skills, critical thinking, and more. Digital learning that enables. New Tech puts technology in the hands of every student. Students, teachers, parents, and administrators have access to learning anytime, anywhere, through a web-based learning system called ECHO. The learning management system, designed to support project-based learning, facilitate communication, and improve teacher practice. And third, a culture that empowers. New Tech's approach gives students relevant responsibility, holds them accountable, <coughs> and encourages them to take ownership of their learning experience and their lives. The result is great student outcomes like most recent 97% one-year graduation rate, or 95% average attendance rate, or a 98% post-secondary acceptance rate. New Tech helps teachers become creators and collaborators who are inspired to be in the classroom, which, in turn, creates inspired students. Over and over, New Tech's proven plan of training, technology, and support transforms schools at every level. It really works, and it can work anywhere. New Tech's innovative approach makes learning all it can and should be, and gives students the skills and knowledge they need to succeed in college and prepare for the careers of tomorrow. As we've traveled around and seen some different programs, uh, there's been some common themes that we've seen as we've gone just about every, every New Tech school that we visited. An atmosphere of collaboration, students and teachers working together. Students are guiding their own learning. Teachers aren't giving information, except where they're needed. They'll pull small groups aside, have what they call a workshop, or a concept that maybe not everybody is getting. Not everybody has to attend, just those students that, that are lacking in that particular knowledge or skill set. We've seen students having to manage their time effectively, and isn't that like real world? Um, every, every class is involved, has a project, and as students complete one, they don't just say, 
oh, I'm going to sit back and relax for a while, all of a sudden I've got another project. And it makes them balance their time, makes them accountable to their teammates, and makes them be very responsible to holding up their end of the deal. One of the most powerful things for me that I, that I saw was, was talking with some special education teachers in that how it has benefited their students that they've learned how to advocate for themselves, identify their strengths and weaknesses as they work in a team, and play on each other's strengths and, and weaknesses as they develop their projects. And like I mentioned earlier, one of the key components is that students can walk in and you can ask them and they know why they're doing what they're doing. They understand that there's a purpose to it and they're fully engaged in what they're doing. Important what New Tech is, but it's also important what it's not. It's not a third high school. It's not an alternative program. It's not just for gifted students. It's for, it can be for any student regardless of ability level. Um, people wonder, what, what is it? Are there, are there courses that you have to take? They just provide that framework that for that systemic change that helps make this a different type of learning environment. So where have we been? We've been on 10 visits. We've taken many people to these different schools uh, from, from Indiana and California and Texas. We've collected that feedback last spring after we had gone uh, down to Pinckney and some other places, and also Texas. Uh, we've been to the New Tech Annual Conference not once, but twice in their planning track. Um, myself and uh, Janet Greif and Pam Castle presented to their staffs at their last, and at the October PD Day. Um, we've got planned another trip to Kent ISD to look at their program on December 3rd. Uh, Paul Buck from the New Tech program is going to be here for that for that visit, and uh, we're in the process of finalizing the details. But I think he's going to be able to present a community forum that evening here, and then possibly with a follow up for staff the next afternoon. So we're working out those final details with Paul from the New Tech Network, and uh, we'll certainly make that information available to parents as soon as soon as we have that all nailed down. Um, so that's where we are, where we're at what we've done, and where we're going. Now, of course, all of this is uh, contingent upon we sub obtaining some alternative funding and support for this program. Um, and it's a pretty aggressive timeline. It, people look at me and say, are you, do you really mean next fall? Um, are you crazy? But it's a lot of work. But we, the steering con committee and, and Mr. Ellinger and Dr. Ellison and myself, felt like we've been, we've looked, we've looked for two years. And if, the, if we're going to move this forward and if we're gonna take that step to really reimagine what we do, now's the time to bring it to your attention and to discuss that and try to work out those details so you can see what it would look like for our, for our students. March would involve a leadership residency for the director. We don't call them principals in, at the New Tech Network, they're called directors. April would be teacher shadowing. June would be a, a full week of new school training for all the teaching staff to attend. And then September would be uh, open the doors and let's start. So that's, that's our tentative timeline. That brings me to the end of my formal presentation, but I'm sure there's probably some questions that I would be glad to answer any of those that, that you would have. So uh, shoot away. Questions? Probably a bazillion. So what's the yeah. first year look like? The first first year look like would be ninth grade only, so about a hundred students, and they would be taking those. I won't say the same classes, but they would be taking the the same type of classes they would at their regular high school, whether Midland High or Dow High. They'd take biology, they'd take a math class, they'd take an English class, they'd take a social studies class, and or an elective. Um, we see a real wide range. Some new tech programs are, they go just for the core only. They go for four classes and then return to their high schools. Some, in some cases, they're there for the entire day. Um, so, and, and a lot of them are, are somewhere in between where students have the opportunity to passport back for a class or two at their, at their resident high school. So um, 
that's the process. We're trying to figure out all those details out and how that would look. Location year one? Um, we've talked about some different locations. Possibly Central Middle School would be a location. Um, has yet to be finalized, but that was one because it's, for obvious reasons, there is the, the um, auditorium there, and it would fit very well. It's a, it's a site between kind of equidistant from Dow High to Midland High, so it wouldn't be uh, uh, closer to either one of those two. It would work well for a lot of reasons there. Yeah, yeah def I definitely uh, agree that it's an aggressive schedule going forward, but I think it's also important for the community to realize what kind of changes can we make to the curriculum to meet the 21st century learning skills. And I think all the things that were on that slide, you can accomplish some of that with the IB program, AP, uh, New Tech, and so forth. And I, I, I definitely agree, you know, trying to reach students how they learn and how individualized they are um, to um, you know, the learn project-based IB it's good to have those options to meet those needs. Um, I like the piece, there's a small paragraph there that talked about the collaboration with the community. And I remember when I visited the New Tech School, I think they complete an internship. And I know a lot of students now, they lack the resume uh, detail, meat and potatoes on the resume, because maybe they haven't worked in an industry. Right. And there's so many opportunities for students to work in this particular area, especially with advanced manufacturing. And I was just looking at a 60 Minutes presentation on, on TV that says, well, we can't find workers that have the math, the critical thinking, and <coughs> so forth. Um, Alcoa was one of those right. manufacturing sites, and it's advanced manufacturing. They said, just give us, give us students that have those abilities, because employers are not really interested in spending the money on the training programs, like maybe what it was years ago. And if some of these students could have you know, these college and career ready skills going forward. I think there's just such a variety that, that's needed to prepare very individualized students and in how they learn. And just to, to follow up on that, it's an option. Um, for some of our students, that would be a great fit for. Um, mm -hmm. The New Tech Network really wants to push towards students doing those internships their junior and especially their senior year and also pushing out to take uh, dual enrollment classes, college classes, so that their goal is for every student to walk out no matter what their career path with 12 credits uh, once they graduate from high school. Just one last thing here is the, uh, uh, thanks. Um, is, that, is that what I sense in the district, that whether you're talking to administrators, teachers, whether you're talking to students, I sense that there is a lot of uh, grassroots and a variety of other sources excitement with this type of, I think everybody senses the need to in innovate in education and I, you know, when I went and visited the schools, the, you know, you could see the students were excited. So I, I haven't, and in the community, I know the need is there too. How can we do education different? And, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that, that I haven't heard any negative. I, and so um, I, I guess, you know, having the communication as things go forward is critical uh, to optimize our communication with all of our, our stakeholders that, and, and I'm not hearing anything that's negative coming back about looking at this as being an option. Well, to, to be quite honest, we, we've got a, as I presented to different uh, groups, there, there are those questions. There's questions about financing. There's questions about how it affects our, our you take 100 students out, 50, let's say, from each high school. Um, it, it does mean some change, and it, might, it could mean some change to some of the programs that we can do there. I mean, that, that's just something that we have to be very upfront about and very honest about, and uh, um, make that decision whether this is really the right thing to do and to really make some significant change for our students, um, what, what this could really do. And, and that's, for me, that, that exciting piece. Oh, I was, you had said, and I know there's different new tech programs emphasize different things, so are we looking to really emphasize STEM if we were to do a new tech program or not? I mean, because you brought that up, but I wasn't mm -hmm. sure if that was the goal here or? I, I think that would be a real powerful piece in our community. Um, obviously that, that's an important piece of who we are as a community and our identity, so I think that would be a focus. Um, when I think of what this program could look like, I don't see it just as people that are gonna go into the science field. I think it's more than that. I think there's more, there's more to STEM than just those four, act, those four letters. So I think it needs to be broad enough to ap ap appeal to a wide range of students. But I also think that uh, we'd re we would be remiss if we didn't really focus on uh, making this a STEM-focused academy or, academy or a program.
And then you kind of touched on a second question that I had is how much effort is being put at looking at what's left behind? You know, when you do pull, like you said, all these kids out of the two schools, is, is there part of this whole timeline that then also sits down and says, okay, now we have, you know, declining numbers of kids in our high schools and now we're pulling out more. What other changes might need to happen at the schools to make sure that those that are left still have the same opportunities they have right now? We've had some really frank conversations with our, both of our high school principals and th they fully realize that as we do the numbers game and look at staffing and, and what sections and are, are made available in the springtime for the following year, that this has got to be factored in. The, the key is that they're both really supportive of this, both Mrs. Castle and Mrs. Greif feel like this program is, uh, I can't speak for them, but, but in our conversations, they're both fully behind this and, and see it as a really good option for our students. Exactly what that'll look like, I, you know, we, we can't really put our finger on that, but um, fully knowing that, that they're behind it, that, that there would probably have to be some type of changes of what, how many sections we'll offer of, let's say, English now. Randy, can you uh, <coughs> refresh my memory? With the trips that I've been on, I do not recall any of the districts telling us that they had to eliminate a class offering or a program because they moved in the area of new tech. Um, I mean, if you look at a, just say an average class size of both high school, just call it 400. I mean, they're a little smaller than that than th they might be in the near future. I mean, you're talking about pulling, you know, roughly 10 to 12 or 13 percent of those students per grade level away. That's probably not going to impact, the, you know, the AP program or the IB program or the other things. It might mean you have less sections of a very high level type class because there are fewer students taking it. Um, and that may create a little more inflexibility on when that class is available. But I don't think we heard about any school district, correct me if I'm wrong, Kathy, anybody right. else that's been on a trip, that said they had to eliminate this program because they moved in the direction of a new tech. Kind of related to that, any early cost projections to get this thing going in terms of incremental costs that we might incur as a district? I can kind of address that. Okay. I mean, Randy's probably more comfortable having me address that, Rick. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's more fun. Yeah, okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. It, uh, you know, some initial costs are like uh, 1.6 million. Uh, ongoing cost once you start up would be in the range of six to seven hundred thousand per year. Per year. I mean, when you think about it, that's yep. a that's a full time administrator, full time administrative assistant you know, at least an extra teacher if you were to have kids there all day, a special ed teacher, a fee at least for the first four years of $115,000 to new tech. You total that and we're in the six to $700,000 range. Um, and without talking about where this would come from because we have no commitments yet, but we have a lot of very interested parties out in the community that I think would like to see something like this happen. And they understand that um, now that we are a little bit more stable, not that our financial challenges are over, um, because we know they're not, uh, I think there's some inclination that they would like to see what we would propose to them. And, and I've already made some formal um, presentations, so we're waiting to see. Yeah. I do understand, though, that when we ask the board to make a decision about both the PYP expansion and this, um, that that's contingent upon funding, so you'd be agreeing in concept, um, either later this month or at the December meeting, um, that if the funding is there to offset those initial costs and we feel we can take some measured, deliberate risk to move a program like this, timing can be everything sometimes in business moves and for us, We've got a window of about 12 to 14 months um, that this, I think, is the time for us if you want to look at some new programming options. Randy, one of the, I won't call it bigot issues, one of the, the challenges we had on IB startup wasn't staff, wasn't training. It was community understanding of what it was and parents' acceptance of that versus the status quo. And in all of the things I see here, it's how we're going to get ready. Any thought or any experiences from those other places you visited of 
how they communicated to parents, uh, et cetera, what the program was, what they expected out of it, um, especially in the first one or two, year one or year two, because people are going to take a giant leap. Mm -hmm. If you're a parent that's used to traditional and you're kind of going, I don't want my kid to be the first mm -hmm. experiment, how do we how do we put out a communication program where we give it any thought to that? But this aggressive of a timeline, you know, parents are going to have to understand it this spring uh, and because and they're making decisions on scheduling yeah. at that point for the next fall. So it's a very aggressive time to get um, eighth grade parents. I, I, so when you do this, you're, you're starting in ninth grade, so right. the eighth grade parents to, who are going to be hit with IB, hit with traditional, and hit with this now. What kind of uh, thinking have we given to how we're going to approach that? Including people on our visitations, which is which is a piece of that pie. Um, we've got one of those, another one scheduled for December. Um, Paul Buck is going to be coming here in December to hold the community forum, and then he's also willing to come back in January for more of a parent night, a parent and student night, which I think would be really key, because um, it. But honestly, it isn't springtime when they're making those decisions. It's January and February in the winter when they're making those decisions. So um, that communication has to be ongoing, and we've got to take as, as much advantage of that as, as we can and to, to get that word out there. Other comments or questions? Randy or Dr. Ellison. Um, very well done. Great presentation. Um, I just have one question, Randy, is uh, c capacity. Uh, let's just say year one goes great, you, you anticipate that you get your anticipated numbers. Uh, what's year three and four look like with respect to what you anticipate for numbers and uh, being able to accommodate those? It's really important to maintain that small school atmosphere. So um, we, would, we would try to limit that to 100 students per grade. Uh, so you'd cap that at 400 students at the end of uh, four years when you've integrated each one of those classes. So that, that's a key component. That's one of those three pillars that as being part of that new tech network is that you don't, you maintain that small school atmosphere. And uh, you know, it's, it's that, the PBL, and then the one-to-one -one computing are three key elements that are kind of non-negotiables for them. Very good, thank you. And Randy, something you didn't highlight, and I think parents will want to know right away, and Tell me if I'm wrong. You're still a student of your home high school. And you still participate in all the extracurriculars at your home right. high school. You may, depending on how we design it, you may even still have classes back in your own, in your own high school. And I think parent, am I correct? And I think our parents really need to understand that. Two things. First off, you're absolutely correct that they are, they can still play basketball or volleyball or run track at their home high school, whatever uh, extracurriculars they want to be involved in. And then another question that I've gotten a lot is, well, how do we decide who goes there? And uh, it's the intent that, that a, a new tech program would really truly mirror the population at their home high school. So uh, virtually all schools do a, do a lottery type situation. Some will take a, a limited number of uh, of their slots and at first come first serve and uh, we've seen pictures of different schools people camped out the night before and uh, <laughs> waiting to get in but but by and large it, it's a lottery and uh, that those numbers should be should you know, as far as gender and uh, uh, special education students percent should reflect your your home high school so in essence it's really a new program that happens to be located um, a bit away from your home building Absolutely. Uh, it, it, it's a program. It's a program and an option. I think those were a couple key key terms that we, we've tried to, to emphasize when we talk to people about that. But when you come in as you win the lottery and you're <laughs> said this ninth grader, do you then stay for the remaining three years? So is that really the key point in as ninth grader with probably very little movement in and out in other years? Is that I, I would say yes. Um, and, and just like there might be some kids that it doesn't fit for. Right, right. If I come in as a ninth grader, you know you signed up for at least this is how we have this envisioned. I signed up for a ninth grader, I'm in for a year. Yeah. I really can't go back three weeks in and right. say, you know, I really don't like this. Right. You're, you're in for the year. At the end of that ninth grade year, you know, if it isn't fit for you, absolutely, go right. back. And, and you can go back to your high school. So um, absolutely, you, you're in. The intent would be that you're there for full, fully right. four years. You get all your graduation requirements, mm -hmm. and you're ready to go on to whatever career path you choose at the end of that four years. Somebody could come in the 10th or 11th year if there was room available. I, I would people think people drop out or not. I, I would think 10th grade 
w would be okay. okay. Once you get to 11th and 12th grade, that right. culture and that way of doing things is so embedded, it would, it would be a bit of a challenge to bring someone in as a, as a junior or senior. So mm -hmm. I mean, my first thinking would be, yeah, if we had some slots in that sophomore year, mm -hmm. that would probably be okay. But as we get into the upper levels, pro probably not. Very good. Thank you very much. And again, it's for information uh, decision coming uh, either at the later board meeting in November and uh, or December. Uh, one thing I think that we need to make sure we emphasize, and Carl alluded to this in his conversation with respect to funding, is that the funding for this is contingent upon uh, outside sources of outside the district. So, so everybody understands that. So, with that, we will move on to uh, an action item. From Dr. Ellison on the advisory board for the in instruction in sex education and birth control. Yes, as you know, the uh, sex ed advisory is actually uh, very heavily legislated, and we come to you annually to approve our membership. Membership is prescribed by the law. I'd like to thank Ms. Baker for the. <laughs> How many years is this? Yeah, I don't even know. Just like sure 29 years or something you've <laughs> been on this, or. <laughs> Just a Probably 15. Game. 15. <laughs> and she's still learning. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, but I wasn't going to say it. So. <laughs> it does for you. So. It's, uh, they meet for the most part as needed. Anytime we have any new material supplies that are purchased, they have to go through a specific process. You'll notice that the asterisks are people who are returning. So most folks uh, are returning. We always have the <coughs> students turning over, of course, as the seniors move out into the world. And so you'll see that usually, unless someone else leaves, we do have the scene, the students are the new members. Also, I'd like to thank um, Jeff Lauer and Gerald Ferguson, who serve as our co-chairs. The law does require that we have a school person and a non-school person uh, co-chair this committee. And the actual numbers of school and non-school people in the representative group. So we appreciate everyone uh, being on that, and we appreciate your action on that this evening. Thank you, Dr. Ellison. So we have an action item for approval of this committee, a standing committee. Uh, I need a motion. So moved. Bill Link, support. <laughs> <laughs> moved by Dr. Kaminsky, supported by Lynn. Uh, any discussion or questions of Dr. Kaminsky before we vote? If not, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Oh, same sign. You have your standing committee. Thank you. Moving on to finance, and I know we don't have an FFO report, so Mrs. Klein. Yes, the first item is for information, and I think the theme of most of my items this evening is community support and partnerships and generosity. Uh, as we mentioned in our last FFO minutes, uh, the Northeast and Northwest Little Leagues approached uh, Jeff Jaster earlier this fall, the principal at Northeast about wanting to do some improvements to the baseball field, which if you're at Northeast is at the very far end of the field uh, toward Plymouth Park, because they're looking to provide a playing area for their 13 through 15 year old baseball players. Uh, the initial plan wasn't uh, quite something that we thought that we could work with, but they've worked with us, worked very closely with the lacrosse program and with the building. And they have a plan that is actually kicking off this week that they are providing all the necessary funding and labor for. So this is at absolutely no cost to the district. And it will allow them to improve their own field, but also to make some modifications that we think will improve our fence line along the football field, accomplish some of the things that the building has been asking for us to do for some years that we have not been able to afford. And it will also greatly improve the playing area for the lacrosse field. Uh, so that's should have started today. Actually, I think lacrosse went out and marked the corners of their field a couple of weeks ago. But we really feel like through working with them and spending the time to really go over the issues that we've came up with a plan that really is a win for all of us as well as for our students. And they have agreed to take on all the maintenance for the baseball part of the project. And the understanding is that should we ever have our own baseball program again, certainly our students would have the first right to use that facility. Uh, but for right now, it will be designed for 13 to 15 year olds, which is appropriate for the age of the building. 
and we'll see some other nice improvements, particularly for the cross along the way. So if someone asks you about why are you spending all that money over at Northeast, you can say we are not spending a dime. Uh, this is something that Little League was willing and able to do, and they were able to get outside funding for it. Linda, I, I just want to add that Linda's really done an incredible job of um, facilitating conversation across La, La Crosse, Little League, other community groups that use the field, and the use of the field by the Northeast program itself. And that sounds like that, that may sound like that's a simple task. <laughs> that isn't because they all have their own interest in what they thought should have happened there. And she found common ground amongst all of them. So good work. Thank you. Yeah. And our number one priority was really the needs of the building itself. Yeah. Uh, and th we certainly would not have gone forward with any of this had Mr. Jaster not been supportive. But he, he really likes, I think, what's going to be able to happen with his facilities. Uh, we also have some gifts totaling $4,548.85. They come from the Dow High School Athletic Booster Club, the Midland High School class of 1952. I believe they keep funds at Chemical Bank that they use for reunions, and at some point they close their accounts and donate the money. So class of 1952 must have decided that they didn't need the funds for a reunion and have donated uh, what was there for the music and the athletic departments. Uh, we also have a donation from Mr. and Mrs. James Pollock for activity fee scholarships, East Lawn Student Council, the Supplemental Education Endowment Fund for East Lawn at the Midland Area Community Foundation, and the Central Middle School Parent Teacher Council. A gift that does, two gifts that require your approval total $12,730.35. Woodcrest PTO, uh, extensive teacher wish list items, classroom magazines, accelerated reader, uh, really quite a lengthy list of things, totaling $5,211.50. And then the balance is a donation from the Midland High School Athletic Booster Club for varsity football uniforms. So uniforms are, are the theme of the evening. Uh, I'm not sure how many uniforms this was, but after hearing the cost of band uniforms, I have to believe that football uniforms yes. are <laughs> probably pretty pricey as well. Yeah, they probably don't last 20 years though. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we have two items that uh, need our attention. Um, uh, move uh, to accept 6.2, number four and five. Support. S moved by Mr. Washburn, supported by Mrs. Baker. Any questions of Mrs. Klein? Pretty clear cut. Again, thanks to all of our donors. Just clarify Just item four and seven. Four and seven, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. With that, we have a motion on the table. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Thank you. You have your gifts, and thank, again, thank you again to all those who uh, participated in that. Human resources, Mr. Verlindi. Okay, the uh, board and the staff extend their deepest sympathy to the family of Ms. Helen Merritt passed away on October 25th, 2012. Ms. Merritt worked at Woodcrest Elementary for 23 years as a co-op, reading aid, Title I aid, and office technical professional. Ms. Merritt uh, retired in 1994. Thank you, Mr. Verlindi, and condolences to her family. So with that, we've you all seen the correspondence to and from the Board of Education. We have two remaining board meetings for the month of uh, November, or I'm sorry, for the remainder of 2012, uh, in November, uh, Mr. Watchman will take the helm as I will be out of town for the November 26th meeting. Uh, and we have one meeting, which is the regularly scheduled meeting in December, on December 10th. So um, we'll get into the study discussion, but before we do that, the, in, for sake of time, you have in front of you um, a ballot that uh, forms the uh, nominating committee for next year's officers, or next slate of officers for the coming year. So if you would be so kind as to indicate on that ballot uh, which three representatives you'd like to be uh, represent you as a board uh, for that, uh, we would appreciate that. So and Mrs. Klein, if you'd be so kind.
And with that, uh, we'll start with study discussion, and we'll start to my right with Mrs. Brandstad. All right. Well, one thing I wanted to highlight last, I think it was just last week, I went to Jefferson's Music and More, and music was kind of a big topic tonight. And uh, Gary was there, too. And um, I just want to highlight a couple of things. First, it was really neat um, the evening when we were in the um, gym watching the band and orchestra, there were a couple um, people doing the announcing, I'm seeing from Dow High School music students. And I just thought that was really neat that they took the time to come and um, lead that event. And so I brought this so I could remember their names. It was Katie Workman and Megan Dean, and they did a fabulous job. And it was neat to see them do that and to take time out. And then the second thing I wanted to highlight, which once again was community involvement, um, there was an individual, and I don't even know if it ended up happening, but who put a challenge out to the kids that if they could raise $1,000 that this individual would um, contribute another 500 for the night, because this Music and More is the fundraising program for Jefferson Music Program. And this individual happened to be talking to the treasurer, and I happened to be standing there, and this person, you know, kind of slipped and went, ooh, you know, no one was supposed to know who they were, and I don't think this individual knew who I was either. So I just want to send out a big thank you to this person for coming forward and doing that. So that would be it. Okay, um, with the uh, uh, with election is passed, uh, welcome to the newcomers that are on the way to the board, and thanks to all the candidates who stepped up and, and ran um, and stepped up to uh, throw their hat in to serve MPS. Um, there was a couple articles that I thought were really nice in Midland Daily News. One was the announcement of the uh, Central Middle School uh, final football game under the lights. I couldn't make it because of a meeting, but it was a really nice touch to uh, celebrate their unity and their identity. Um, I thought that was really nice. And it was a very nice article that was on a teacher from Seabert, uh, Susan uh, Schaefer. She received a prestigious history award, and she's there hugging her students, and they all gathered in the gym to uh, celebrate that award. It was a really nice touch. Um, with the, uh, the, I think, said a lot of my comments about the new tech program. I, I thought uh, Mr. Shadig did a great job, and everybody else that's working in concert to make that effort and showing the community what we can do with the curriculum options. Um, I just, I'm really excited about that, and I, I just think that definitely education needs to change. And I think of the book that we had uh, about where schools can't do it alone. And I thought that was a great reference for all of us to look at and uh, to have some agreement upon where education can go. Um, I know the iPad parent information nights are coming up um, where parents are going to start to learn about the rules of the road and um, how they use these tools. I, I do know that teachers are getting some chances to look at the opportunities, the programs, and the way that these can work uh, way ahead of time before the students get them so that they understand uh, what tools, apps, and so forth they can use. Um, there's just hundreds of options for them to use this one tool, um, textbooks and so forth. Um, I was looking at the gifts list um, to the district. We're over $100,000 already, 17000 tonight. Um, and I just think that that's fabulous. We're fortunate to have the, the gifts and the support from the community. I also wanted to congratulate uh, Kim and Scott uh, for stepping up to the plate in the election. And um, I guess I'm getting probably a little melancholy in my last remaining meetings here and stuff. But there, there is an excitement to know that there's some fresh energy and fresh per perspectives and fresh experience that will come to the board. And I think that's good. I think it's very healthy. So I wish both of you very good luck and stuff. Um, you'll find it very, very rewarding. A little bit of challenging along the way, too, but very rewarding. Um, I also want to congratulate uh, Midland High football team. I know several of us were out there Saturday. And it was a, Tough day on Saturday. They played against an outstanding team. Um, but it's no small feat to, in, in any sport to be ranked number one in the state. So I want to congratulate them and have an outstanding, terrific season. Um, also, it just uh, does my heart warm to see the presentation on the music parents tonight and uh, see how they collaborate. It's always wonderful to see the schools come together, all the schools in the district, with the community to partner and collaborate together for something um, that's as important as, as our music program here. So that's kind of a very gratifying to me too and, and as well as the new tech program and I, I think you know for it seems like years um, maybe I can put things in perspective now looking back on 20 years but it's nice to know that I think we've kind of turned the corner where not that we don't have financial challenges but it's nice to see us building growing improving doing something different not always to kind of figure out how we can do you know more with less kind of thing so I, I think that's kind of exciting it really is and I wish you all good luck in that program as you, as you go forward in the coming months and the, in the coming years so, that's all I got. Lynn. I'll start with um, congratulating Kim and Scott as well. 
Well, I look forward to it, and if there's anything we can do to, to help, it's a continual learning process. I'll just say that, even after this many years. But um, lots of exciting things on the horizon, as you're hearing. And Randy, uh, you already know how excited I am about new tech. So, and I had the privilege of going down to t Dallas. And what was so interesting is we saw two different, very different districts um, putting this program in place. And I think the best, the best publicity was the kids. And I, you know, teachers, they loved it once they were trained. They said it's a whole new mindset for them as well. But if, if you could see these kids and the poise and the, the way they present themselves and their excitement for learning, it was just, uh, it was, it was a very big selling point. So we'll see where that goes. And uh, I was at the football game the other day too, and uh, the kids played wonderful, band played wonderful. Uh, and uh, you know, I just thank all the people that are behind the scenes as well. There's so many parents and fans, and, and um, they're always there supporting. And, and it was, it was the, the stadium was full, both sides. So it says a lot about <coughs> the interest. And I think I read that the volleyball team, uh, you know, they, they are no longer in the running, but they've had a, a great season as well. The, C uh, the Central Middle School and Jefferson football game, it was very, very heartwarming to go there that evening. I bundled up, and, uh, and you could just hear, hear the chatter around. And I remember it was a couple little boys walking in front of me, and they said, you know, we just love Central. I think we should write to the Board of Education about keeping it open. And I wanted to say, Oh, I wish we could, <laughs> but, but uh, anyway, there, th those stands too, that cold night, um, the community center in conjunction with the schools have done just a great job and um, recognizing Central and, and um, the, the um, announcement in the, at the halftime having the alumni come down the, with students and parents. It was, it was very nice, very well done. And I guess uh, talking more about what's going on with our students and music, Friday is, is uh, the Midland High Rhapsody Rendezvous already. It seems to have snuck up very quickly, so that's always a wonderful evening. And also this weekend, Dow High is putting on their play Schoolhouse Rock. So, and then I guess some of the band and the teachers and the student councils are all in the Santa Parade. So it's, it looks like it's a busy weekend for for Midland Public Schools. So I hope you get a chance to get out and enjoy some of this. Thanks, Lynn. Mm -hmm. Yvonne. Well, I just wanted to congratulate, congratulate our two new board members, too. I see you're both here this evening, so thanks for coming. And I know it always feels good to win. <laughs> and um, <laughs> I look forward to working with both of you. And also, I wanted to mention what Lynn said, too. Don't forget Rhapsody this Friday night. That's always a great time. And that's it. Um, Congrats, Kim and Scott. Welcome. Uh, don't hesitate to call any of us anytime. Questions, you just want to sit down and talk, whatever. It's an open invitation. Um, new tech, yeah. Uh, I get to go on a visit next week or next month or whatever that is. Um, but something struck me during your presentation, and that was uh, being an engineer, being on the um, advisory panel to Case Western Reserve University's School of Engineering. The number one issue. Uh, that they've identified is having students want to go into these fields, okay, into STEM as STEM, science, technology, engineering. The more we can broaden what we do that gets kids interested, just interested, even if we don't label it STEM, <laughs> we're, we're going to be well off because as kids get in and get interested and, and get themselves a passion for these kind of subjects, we'll feed that train. So I like what you said of, you know, let's not narrow that focus so tightly that it gets labeled that. We'll focus that direction, but let's get it open so that uh, it draws in the maximum number of students that could be interested, because that is the number one issue. So here, thank you. Uh, and then just a shout out to the community again. Look at the gifts we had. Here we're talking about new tech. We're talking about uh, the IB at elementary, and we're all talking about community support for those programs beyond tax dollars. And uh, the band guys coming forward again, the music guy parents coming forward again, round two for them, not just round one, hats off. And uh, I just, it's just unique for Midland, at least from my perspective, the communities I've lived in. Uh, so it's great to be here. And uh, Lindy said something about the Santa Parade. Gary, I'll get nostalgic. My first year on the board, I remember walking with you down there. <laughs> so. That's it.
Thank you, and th thank you all for, uh, as usual, for having a clear understanding of what's been going on and what's going to happen uh, in the near future. Uh, before I get into my comments, I'll, I'll announce that the nominating committee for uh, the slate of officers for the coming year will be myself, Rick Oley, and Lynn Baker. So with that, uh, we will, uh, I will communicate with both of you uh, probably through Cindy or maybe direct email as to when we'll start uh, having uh, those discussions. Uh, Kim and Scott, um, your journey begins because uh, it, uh, it truly is a journey. Uh, as Rick has indicated, uh, there are uh, many uh, exciting t uh, things that you'll experience as a new uh, school board member uh, and it rewards that um, exemplify such a great district and that you will, uh, in January, will start representing. Um, and you, tonight's a perfect example of what you heard uh, as to what we have in our future with IB and New Tech and all the other things that this great district offers. And, uh, um, you know, while it's kind of surreal that uh, Rick and I are leaving, uh, it also uh, is very encouraging to leave uh, uh, having uh, all this uh, happening um, in our midst with respect to what we offer young people in their educational experience. Uh, Randy, um, I, I think this is spot on. I think this is a perfect opportunity for this district to broaden its horizons. I think there's uh, a potential for us to grab at more growth with respect to student enrollment through this process. When you look at the offerings that we put on the plate, there isn't a district in this in this in the Great Lakes Bay region that will have more on their uh, to offer students than this district, and I think it's uh, that, that's encouraging and exciting at the same time. So, um, with that, um, I have one thing uh, on a housekeeping note for all those who will remain after January one. Um, the administration and Carl and I have talked about this uh, is planning on a half day retreat in January uh, for board members. So start looking at your calendars. It will be, uh, I'm, uh, I'm assuming it's going to be on a Saturday morning till probably early morning till lunchtime kind of thing. So start, please look at your calendars to look at uh, what might be best uh, for dates. And uh, I'm sure Cindy will communicate that out uh, on some possible dates as uh, that starts to materialize. So with that, uh, great week in sports and all the activities that this district has uh, been reading about and hearing about. Uh, and I will turn it over to Mr. Allinger. Just a couple of clarifications. I think Ken f said for the five of you remaining on the board, that would also include Scott, you and yep. Kim. If you can let us know your availability on half days, um, that would help us find a common date, a uh, date that is available for most sports. You and I are just skiing or something, aren't we? Uh, yeah. there it is. Maybe <laughs> Florida then. <laughs> yeah, water skiing. Right? <laughs> Um, the other thing related to the process is that um, for uh, the sitting board members, it, it typically officers for the board have been um, sitting board members previously. But if you have an interest, um, uh, here's what the policy says. Board members will submit officer role and or committee assignment preferences to the nominating committee. So if all of you have preferences for any of those, please communicate that to Ken or Rick or Lynn, and then they'll deal with that on their end. I don't... Uh, I don't have any input into that. That's all a board decision. Um, I, too, was at the Central football game um, last week in the evening, and um, it was really incredible. First of all, the game was outstanding. Um, the, the, so much fun to watch middle school sports because there was one halfback for, I forget which team, I think it was Central, who, if he is 5'7 or 5'8, he's big. Um, <laughs> And uh, very athletic, very quick, and just surprised everybody because he was so small physically on what an effective halfback he was. So it was great to be there. It was very gratifying to see, I think, over 100, over 80 or 100 people who were alumni who came up on halftime uh, out on the field. And people all the way back to the 1950s, some early coaches, uh, Coach Quick, who was a former AD, I think maybe the first AD Dow at Dow High, High School yeah. was there. Yeah. Uh, you saw all kinds of people. That was a homecoming that night. And you could tell the kids were just um, picked up because of all that support and enthusiasm. It was really fun to be there and be part of that. So um, if you missed that one, you missed something really special, let me tell you. Um, to take focus back on kids, um, kudos to the Carpenter Street School staff 
and especially to the Reading Promise team for helping promote Carpenter's Reading Promise. The team hosted an Open Promise event on October 23rd, which brought in 194 students and family members. The Carpenter Gym was packed with people ready to make a promise, supporting Carpenter students, reading skills, and purposeful parent involvement. So that was a neat activity. Congratulations to uh, Kim McMahon, who is an Adams Spanish teacher, and to Monique Scott, a Midland High School special education teacher. They have been selected as part of the Rotary Group Study Exchange Team visiting South Korea in April of 2013. So the district will release them. I believe they're gone for three weeks. Ken, you're a fellow Rotarian, uh, maybe even a little over three. They have an exchange program. We'll be hosting as a club a Korean uh, Group Study Exchange be a great experience for Monique Scott and uh, Kim McMahon. They're both well deserving of that. Uh, congratulations to Miles uh, Kilbreth uh, from Midland High School for qualifying for state cross country meet. He took second place at this year's regionals. Uh, more informational in nature, as we look at our fall count numbers, it appears our enrollment revenue will be only slightly under budget. Our 2012-13 budget reflected an FTE of 8,099 students. Our total adjusted K-12 and special education FTE was 8,090.36. That's a difference of only 8.64, approximately $63,000. You know what, there's really only one person in the room responsible for getting this account that close. Again, guess who that is? <laughs> Linda Klein. Linda was oh. off by eight, what was that about? <laughs> 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 An interesting. An interesting side note related to our enrollment revenue, our fall 2012 non-resident school, school of choice enrollment was up over 64 FTE for the, from the fall of 2011. Wow. That is a good sign for us and we've done some uh, uh, cross-referencing of databases. Uh, we're going to go after students that used to reside here. Uh, maybe their families still do reside but they attend somewhere else. I think we can get much more aggressive with a PR and marketing campaign. So that's a goal that we're working on this year. Um, Jefferson Middle School, Saturday, November the 3rd, the Jefferson Middle School forensics team had their first ever appearance at a tournament where they experienced tremendous success. A number of students achieved first and second place scores, including numerous perfect rounds. This team may be new to tournament competition, but they competed like veterans, achieving an overall second place standing. So. Congratulations to them. And then another chemic salute to Heijun Kim and Ben DeGroote. Uh, Heijun took first place in her high school women's division, and Ben DeGroote uh, took second place in the high school men's division at the statewide singing competition in Grand Rapids, sponsored by NATS, the National Association of Teachers of Singing. And then also congratulations to the Michigan, or to the Midland High School varsity volleyball team for the third year in a row of being undefeated in the Saginaw Valley, so obviously they are the champs. And I think Lynn alluded to that earlier. Uh, lastly, congratulations to the Dow High debate team that participated in the highly competitive National University of Michigan debate tournament the first weekend in November. Out of 81 teams, the Dow High novice team broke to double octafinals. Please don't ask me what that is. We didn't <laughs> have enough time to find out. Billy Schutte paced 11, uh, placed 11 speaker overall and Sam Ungerleiter uh, poised second. This is a highly impressive accomplishment for these students and for Dow High School. So kudos to them. Uh, they represented themselves and all of you as a board in our district very well. There you go, sir. Anything else for the good of the order? If not, I will take a motion to adjourn. So move. Moved. Support. Moved by Mr. Oley, supported by Mr. Watchman. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Stand adjourned at 848. Let me know. There we go.